everybody and thank you to all of you at home watching in Zoom land. Um, also particular thanks to the organizers of Cafe Scientifique in Romsey, inviting me here to make a presentation this evening. Um, while not a lawyer myself and far from it, I'm hoping that uh, I'll be able to share with you some of the observations that I've been able to make on understanding how the 70% of the world's surface covered in water, as we all know, how it gets carved up under the international law of the sea system, or not, as the case may be, as we'll see. These observations have come from quite a bit more than about 30 years, 30, 40 years now, working as a government scientist, formerly at the Institute of, Institute, Institute of Oceanographic Sciences near Godalming in Surrey, and latterly at the National Oceanography Centre in Southampton. My research, as John was saying, was applied to understanding what parts of ocean science were important for the management of oceans. And in my case, how much countries had, countries that had a coast could rightfully claim in terms of maritime space, how to go about it and what resources could potentially exist there. That work extended to advising coastal countries in particularly small island states and developing states on making and claiming, making, man, maintaining the claims to international bodies such as the United Nations, and in a number of cases, helping them defend their rights against hostile neighbors at the international court. For the past 12 years, John pointed out, pointed out this has been continued as a consultancy, Maritime Zone Solutions, based at the quite splendidly addressed offices, I might say, at the little brew house, Horse Fair Tower, part of the old Strong's Brewery here in Romsey. So this work as a marine geologist, but working alongside lawyers and counsel in courts over this time, has by some odd process of osmosis enthused me and enlightened me a little bit and enabled me, I think, to understand a little bit of how the ocean's claim game works. I'm gonna share some of that with you this evening. So naturally, I'm going to devote my talk entirely to the sea. Between us, we have more than 360 million square kilometers of it to deal with. Um, and in many ways, uh, it's our life. It's our lifeblood. It's our carbon lung. It's a source of much of our food. It's our mean of travel and connecting with each other, or has been. And the world's oceans provide us minerals, oil and gas and Phytoplankton and algae create much of the world's oxygen, and it, the ocean keeps climates stable to a certain extent by storing heat from the sun. The dangers are, of course, now that we have pollution, we have garbage in the ocean, that reduces oxygen, harms and damages life. Fishing, overfishing and oil spills, again, harm the ocean. They're an intrinsic part of our lives, but they're also a force to be reckoned with. For instance, with sea level, threats grow. Threats grow to many. And we think about there's more than 100 million people who live within one metre of mean sea level in the world. So we're no strangers to vast expanses of ocean. Our forebearers have been exploring and venturing offshore, either for necess necessity or curiosity for, for the millennium. So movement across the seas and the oceans has been a fact of life for many, for many over many millennia. Na the, the navigating where these travellers go to and where they are has always been a challenge. And please allow me to indulge myself in a couple of minutes on my favourite seafarers, the Polynesians. They originally, they believed to originate in South, South China, started exploring South and East into uh, between 2000 and 1500 years BC, and they arrived in what we now call the South Pacific, spreading through the islands and then eastwards into Polynesia and, and as far as Easter Island. But how did they go anywhere? I mean, or rather, how did they get back from where they've been? Well, it seems from oral traditional records, they navigated by following, for one thing, various bird migration paths, including that of the long-tailed cuckoo and the Pacific plover to maintain steady courses and to search out the land in the vastness of the seas that they were traveling in. They released frigate birds, which they'd carried with them in cages and then let free. They let them go and then they waited. 
frigate birds don't land on water. And so if they return to the vessel, they, they, they knew they were not very close to land, but if they headed off, the explorers would follow in hot pursuit. So navigation progressed with time, and it's known that in many parts of this Polynesian culture, Melanesian culture, the developing cultures, stick maps were made and used by many as a way to navigate. And these astonishing records were really the very first seagoing charts. They represented, or they were used to represent major ocean swells. The islands were the shells attached to the, the, uh, the, the, these were actually fronds of parts of, of coconut, um, midrib, midrib fronds of coconut. And the lines between them, the threads be between them reckon that would, were reckoned as, as ocean surface waves and ocean swell directions. Now, this is wonderful. And, and these individual charts, although varied so much in form and interpretation, it's very often only the person who made them that could interpret them. But astonishingly, these, these charts were used, these stick constructions were used up until the middle of last century um, before electronic navigation uh, took over. But this development of these proto charts is extremely exciting, as we see. These constructions, the earliest form of semi permanent navigation chart devices, have developed into the hydrographic charts, hydrographic navigation charts, which are essential to enable the equitable division and the distribution of enormous areas of the world's oceans. So, as a way of appreciating and understanding the political pattern of our oceans, Logically, we should have some form of map or an atlas of the oceans. But as we know, world atlases today have little more than land political boundaries, such as the one on the screen at the moment. I do think this image somehow makes us feel like things have been sorted out as far as the land goes, at least on this scale. But it, it, it seems to appear that we know where everything is and that somehow gives us comfort. But as we can see, there's almost no information for the oceans and the maritime boundaries. So countries with coasts can and should enjoy some rights to the seas and the oceans on which they look out on. Standing on the beach and looking out to sea, the curvature of the earth means that you can only see just under three miles, but that's, that's no limit at all. The sea's resources, as living and non-living, have been exploited beyond that limit ever since man set to sea. And it's the edge of that area of ownership where it starts the land boundary with your neighbor, for instance, that's where your land boundary stops, but what direction does it go when it goes into the sea? What would, what would make it the, follow the same direction as it is on land? And, and equally, what factors might make it change from that direction? And how far can it go? What happens when that line bumps into another country's line coming in the opposite direction? We need some basis to start unraveling these questions. And the answers lie in having accurate portrayals of what we want to apportion, in other words, maps. The problem has been really is that until the last 50 or so years, it's been pretty difficult to map and survey the oceans with a consistent accuracy. And that, that means in turn that of course maintaining an understanding of where your limits are and the understanding of your maritime space has been problematic, both in practice and theory. It's difficult to maintain judgment. Lindsay, uh, your papers are rustling by your microphone, I think. So you, we're getting quite a lot of noise from your papers hey, rustling. I'll move those off. Okay. So there have been a number of attempts in the past three or 400 years to instill some form of principles to the world oceans. A chap called Hugo Grotius is a Dutch jurist, philosopher, writing on, uh, on the sea in... 1609, introduced the laws of common access. He, he introduced a, a concept called mare liberum, so freedom of the seas. And in this, he formulated a principle, and this was a new principle for the sea, that, in, that it was international territory and that all nations should have access to it. And then nobody had the right, right to deny other people access to it. And I have to say, this must've been pretty revolutionary at the time because given that maritime powers at that era have established themselves throughout Europe, 
and were at that time herring across the oceans, plundering and colonizing uh, the far off lands. But actually Grotius was on the right track. He, he, his views were the start of how man should democratize the oceans. So the steps before to formulating the access and entitlements of the oceans. It's passed through many eight stages, been driven by the large maritime powers, of course, but it's astonishing that it's still only been in the last 40 years when a, a regime that covered all of those activities and the governance of the ocean has been developed. And this goes from the coast right out to the deepest ocean. And we have to jump to, forward to 1982, to the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, in front of us, we have the UN Tower in New York. And it was guided by the United Nations that a conference, series of conferences set up in order to establish a, a regime, a, a form of governance that would apply to all states that signed up to it. And it was astonishing because this is it, the end, 1982 was when it came up for signature, but this was 14 years of work in the making. It had 150 countries that worked on this over the years. And when it came open for signature in December in, uh, in 1982, people were desperate to sign this and ratified. And now we have 168 nations, 168 states, that are member parties, ratified member parties, states parties of the convention. And that's pretty amazing too, because there's only 155 states that have got coasts. So some states have signed the convention, even though they are landlocked and or geographically disadvantaged. And this is amazing. It, but the convention also allows for uh, special uh, provisions for those states as well. The other remarkable thing about the convention is that it's a package. There are 300 odd articles in there. And if you sign up for the convention, you sign up for every one of those articles. So there's no opting out of any of them. And they cover full range of the biological resources, mineral resources. It deals with uh, shipping, straits, operation of marine sites and so on. And, and, and that had to deal with all the opposing interests of uh, the very different different countries that were bidding into this. So compromise was a major part. The other peculiarity of it is that it, it's a text in six different languages, all equally uh, acceptable. Arabic, Chinese, English, French, Russian, and Spanish. And these are, these are used um, throughout the world. One of the things that the convention tried to do more than anything was to standardize the various rights and responsibilities of coastal states. Previously, the same terms and the same words were used in different acts and different agreements by states and by states actors. For example, I had to describe the maritime zones, but until 1982, nobody agreed on how wide most of those zones would be. The territorial sea is a great example of this. Up until that conference in 1982, Territorial Sea had been talked about for hundreds of years, but had never been quantified. It had been sort of quantified with the cannon shot rule, which was a limit of three nautical miles, which had been used rather informally since the 17th century as a rule of thumb as to how far out a coastal state should be able to defend its territory from hostile foreign sources. The cannon shot rule proved basically provided that a sovereign state had jurisdiction over the coastal waters that it could defend from its onshore artillery. I have to say, it's, it's probably highly, like, highly unlikely that any cannon in the 17th century or even the 18th century had any possibility of reaching three miles of trajectory. But the point was made, there was a figure on this. And this lasted by, this lasted usage by several coastal states until the convention in 82. So the nuts and bolts of the convention in terms of its distances that people had certain rights over are, 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 are laid out on the, on the slide here. The territorial sea, territorial waters, is really the cornerstone of much of the law of the sea 
all it, it refers to the area of the oceans which is most proximal to the coast secures all the key interests of the uh, of the coastal state it has complete jurisdiction over it over all the activities the water the seabed and the airspace all the resources the regularity control and policing and security the next section of the oceans adjacent to the state beyond this is the exclusive economic zone this was also another concept a new concept in 1982 these waters extend between 12 and 200 nautical miles from the coast and here the state enjoys exclusive right over the exploration and exploitation, conservation management of all living and non-living resources. So we're talking about everything, the water column, the fish, etc., and everything on the seabed and subsoil, oil and gas and minerals. The idea behind this is that by assigning these zones to the management by, of directly of coastal states that a sustainable system of fisheries or Mineral, mineral exploitation could be maintained. Well, we now know that three quarters of these waters are at or exceed a level of being overfished. So it hasn't worked. And, and there are many reasons for that not working, many of which comes down to the coastal states themselves being unable um, to exercise their rights or in some cases not being aware of those rights. The third item of the margin, the continental shelf, is something which to many of us will mean the shallow platformal area of the seabed adjacent to the coast, and that eventually finds its way, it drops off into the deep ocean floor, several thousand metres water depth. And we reckon on some margins, of course, this part of the seafloor is a very broad and um, expansive area. That could be, for instance, the Grand Banks of offshore Canada. In other parts of the world, such as offshore Western South America, we know this is very limited areas. So the law of the sea introduced a concept of juridical or legal content or shelf, which replaced, uh, if you like, the geological side, the scientific content or shelf. We don't have time to discuss how we would mark that content or shelf out with accuracy, but it actually depends on the morphology of the seabed and the distribution of sediments as one reaches the, uh, the edge of the, uh, of the continental margin. The interesting thing about this extra part for the continental shelf, it meant that certain coastal states could extend beyond 200 nautical miles. If they went beyond 200 nautical miles, they've lost the access to the living resources in, this, in the water column and the, if you like, the extended continental shelf, these extra bits uh, are, are only for the seabed resources or the subsea floor. Now we can take a look at, just as a quick cartoon here, um, I think if I use the, the cursor here, we can see uh, the land, uh, you see our 12 nautical miles, this is our territorial sea. Uh, we'll leap out to the 200 nautical miles this is exclusive economic zone and here we have a, a deepening of the water sea, sea column um, water column until we reach the an area that's before you get to the deep oceans deep ocean floor the deep sea floor which is referred to as the outer continental shelf and and this is the area that um, has to be uh, has to be claimed by a coastal state if they feel they could go beyond the 200 mile limit. So to sum up, let's have a quick look at the numbers here. Uh, the total area of our oceans, as I said, 360 odd million square kilometers. Everybody has a 12 nautical mile that has a coast, has a 12 nautical mile territorial waters. And they can also claim up to 200 nautical miles Nautical, uh, nautical miles exclusive economic zone. That comes to about 138 million square kilometers and that extended continental shelf, those extra bits that uh, coastal states could claim get to be about another, that's gonna cover about another 30 to 40 million square kilometers. Now, there's, a, there's all the stuff that's left now, which is in the deepest parts of the ocean. And this is about 200 million square kilometers and this is referred to under this 
United Nations Convention as the area. Sounds very grand, but this area is, is reserved for the common good of mankind. And actually, this is really uh, what uh, Grotius back in 1609 was, uh, that's, that's the area that is for common, that's all that's left, because as coastal states have claimed their waters and their entitlements close to the land, this is where, uh, it, this has left the area that's, if you like, um, international waters. The common thread to the convention and the common thread to the creation or calculation of the limits for a coastal state is that they are all measured from a baseline. The baseline, you, we can think of it as in terms of a series of points which run more or less, well, they do run along the coastline, they more or less run along the low water mark. And it's from that low water mark that the 12 nautical mile limit is measured and the 200 mile and so on and so forth. And, and you can see that while some parts of coast, this is just a cartoon, but you can see that some coastlines are relatively simple. Others have complications like offshore islands and bays and, and reefs and so on. But here we have a simple con construction of 12 nautical miles. You can see some of the pale gray lines are the lines of, we call them construction lines, uh, to identify this outer limit. The process to obtain the 200 mile limits is effectively the same. You start with the base points and you measure 200 nautical miles out. We do this now with computers and software and databases, but traditionally, and up until quite recently, this was done by, by hand using paper charts of the coastal waters and a, an HB pencil, presumably, and a sharpening, sharpener at the same time. So where are we at the moment with all these limits, with sorting these limits out? Well, as it turns out, not very far, not very far at all. But all the maps that uh, are used to establish these limits are re readily available. Some states have been extra slow to convert those provisions of the convention into uh, their rightful areas. So, and that's even, let alone organize the policing of those resources or the protection of the environment and so on. They, many have been too busy surviving the poorer and developing countries. Small islands, small island states and the disadvantaged states continue to struggle to stop, in many cases, the greater sea powers from ransacking their own precious resources. So as a, as a rough estimate, there are about approximately twice as many unresolved or non-established boundaries in the world as there are established. And the number of bar maritime boundaries which exist, either, either agreed, delimited, or as yet unsettled, is probably in excess of 900, which means there are something like 450, maybe 500 maritime boundaries which are not established to date. Here's the example of Africa. Africa has 38 coastal states, and it has a number of island states, the Cape Verdes and uh, Mauritius and Seychelles and Comoros Islands. And their coastal, the combined African coastal uh, entitlements in the EEZ is about 13 million square kilometers. Out of all those boundaries, only 27 have been agreed or established. There are 52 maritime boundaries still to fix. And this is Africa. This is Africa. The type of margin all the way around Africa is one which is the most likely to be producing uh, an environment for the development of hydrocarbons. So to provide a quick tally of all the global progress on maritime boundaries, I'm showing you a chart which shows all the exclusive economic zones of the world. Here they, they're marked in pale blue. Oceanward of the, these exclusive economic zones, there's a whole range of colors and those are, those mark the areas that the, uh, that certain coastal states have extended beyond 200 nautical miles. This, if you like, this extended continental shelf. 
and the different colors don't, don't, don't matter, but you can see that the area that's being left to, uh, for the common heritage of mankind is steadily diminishing. Now, this is 200 nautical miles, uh, 200 uh, million square kilometers, so it's still a reasonable amount. But this is the part that is, relates to the Grotius's 17th century uh, principle. That area that's left is not attributed to any coastal state. It's been formalized now under the convention and placed under the auspices of the of a UN body, the United Nations body called the International Seabed Authority, has its headquarters in Jamaica. And the main component of that authority is to ensure non-appropriation of that area by, by states, other states or private entities, and to, to make sure that it's prevailed over in, in terms of peaceful use. So having tried to set the scene a little bit and tried to reassure everyone that there is a regime which is uh, which is which has now been in operation for uh, 40 odd years. I'd like to spend the rest of the remainder of the talk looking at some curiosities which have arisen out of that uh, and that have stemmed, stemmed rather from the, the, the this government system, this governance of the oceans, the law of the sea. So before we get ourselves and uh, ahead of ourselves and congratulate ourselves on the law of the sea to base our decisions on, we should get our reality hats on and see how easy it is putting it all into place. I've got four topics here we're going to look at, and I'm going to illustrate, you know, the challenges that the lawyers, the technical advisors, and and the, the coastal states, the countries themselves, have to face. The first is where we are. Um, well, for quite a bit of the world's oceans, we might know exactly where we are thanks to GPS, which even with our mobile phones, we can get a, a three to four meter accuracy. But it's actually the location of the relationship of where you are to uh, where land is. And that is uh, that can be problematic if we have uh, difficulties with our standard quality of charting and, and mapping. Secondly, we have, we have a lot of lumps of rock that are scattered around the oceans, which are, according to some provisions in the law of the sea, these are land, islands, the island states, when they were arguing about the, the drafting in, in the 70s leading up to the 1982 convention, the island states were extremely worried that lots of people were talking about continental shelves. And the island states were saying, well, you know, we're not a continent, but we do have a shelf. And it was made very clear to them that islands are land masses. So you can think of islands and continents as land masses. Cont islands can have a, a continental shelf. But some of these lumps of rock that are distributed around the world have take some imagination, some, some huge amount of imagination in, in, in establishing them as or understanding them as, as land masses. And we'll come to that. Thirdly, we're going to put on the shoes, put ourselves in the shoes of the communities that are at most threat to uh, from some rising sea level and examine how the law of the sea convention might deal with that, although it doesn't actually recognize in the text that exists at the moment about it. And finally, we'll, we'll finish off with a few words on boundary disputes and how they get fixed. So a quick look at the one of the essential elements of all maritime delimitation and delineation, hydrographic charts. Without these, we will be absolutely unable to establish accurate and governable boundaries. So the UK Hydrographic Office, uh, set in Taunton, has a, a worldwide coverage. And there are worldwide coverages in, in various other countries, major maritime powers, France, Russia, the US, and Canada, and so on. But, and they, they mostly look the same. They mostly cover the same areas. They're actually the same scales. But there's some problems. So, some areas in these charts have not been surveyed for some time, some not since Captain Cook, and some areas have hardly been surveyed at all. That means that in some of the charts, we have information that's really, really poorly, uh, should not be relied on. These charts, remember, they're principally used for safety of navigation. They weren't originally intended to identify coastal 
points with the accuracy that now we need to identify maritime boundaries. So let's have a look at this chart. This is a French chart from Chom, the, the, the French equivalent of, of uh, the Hydrographic Office. It's, uh, it's on the coast of Ghana. And it's actually the one in current use in the, in the Toga Ghana maritime boundary delimitation or dispute case, which has been raging for years. It looks pretty good. There's lots of numbers in the ocean. These are all soundings. It's got some shipping lanes. Excellent. But there's a small box up here, which is one of the most interesting parts of the, any chart. If we have a look at it, or a small part of it, difficult, I'm sure you can see on the screen any, any detail there. But if I can blow it up a bit, we can see that actually it's a small version of the coast itself. And just offshore the coast is a series of letters. And I'm sorry, this is going to be fuzzy because that's uh, just the way it enlarged. But there are a series of letters which refer to the most recent surveying of that particular map. So it's basically the data source where this map came from. And I say probably for the vast majority of coast, they have a little letter D, if you can see that. The last surveying was in 1837 to 1846. And it also, though you can't, maybe can't read that, it says lead line. So that would refer to the coast, not the lead line, not the, the house soundings, but it would refer to the navigation, the navigation and the identification of the, the sea floor and the coastal line. And that means that no one has checked that coast for accuracy since that time. Now, it's important because of course this, these, this coast as we sit in is, is used and promontories on that coast and points on that coast, headlands are used by coastal states to identify um, uh, their 12, 200 nautical mile limits. And practitioners of maritime boundary construction use that geography of the coast to define boundaries. State Here we have state X, this is a cartoon, made it up, state X and state Y are trying to sort out their maritime boundary. You can see they've, they've got their territorial sea and their 200 nautical miles. But to construct the limits between each other, the most normal, the simple process is to identify a series of points moving away from the coast, which are equal distance from state A as they are from state B. And that creates in this case, because of this rather convoluted coastline, a bent shape to a, uh, the, 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 the boundary up until the point here when it goes more or less straight out to sea. So close to the sea, sea close to the coastline, small differences in the coast really screw up where your coast is, your boundary is going to be further away it tends to become more and more normalized if you like standardized so this line is hardly ever straight i don't think it's ever straight but most the simple law about that's in the convention particularly for areas very close to the sea is that the boundary between your neighbor and yourself is going to be this, we call it equidistance or a median line. When you get offshore beyond 12, it can be adjusted and that adjustments can be made based on a number of things. And we'll bring those into play in a moment. So let's see how this can be good or bad for states. This is the Bay of Bengal. We have India, Bangladesh, and Myanmar all facing into a, uh, a, a, a huge area of natural resources. Um, the Bay of Bengal, full of sediments, lots of gas, for instance, lots of oil, lots of oil there. If we use the principles as the previous slide and try to uh, establish equidistance line, we will reach a problem because all three of the northern-based states of the Bay of Bengal and including India have rights to that area. They are claiming in that direction. And you can see there's a, there's a confluence, a convergence of claims, which actually 
doing a simple construction as we we just had a look at would mean that Bangladesh would end up by being heavily squeezed out of the picture. In fact, Bangladesh's maritime space would probably finish in some sort of triangle here as India and Myanmar squeeze it, uh, squeeze it out. And of course, this is something that we have to guard against when we uh, assume that equidistance are the simplest case. We then have to adjust this to, in order to give some uh, equitable solution to Bangladesh as well as for India and Myanmar. That equitable solution can be anything. It could be a corridor that's been made out for Bangladesh. Another problem that comes in is when you have islands, and this is a familiar piece of territory for, for us all, of course, islands can be a problematic when they're near to the coastline but they're particularly problematic when they're far away from your own coastline and, and close to another's. And uh, we, we, have a, we have a situation where a boundary was needed to be established between the UK and France in the, the English Channel. But of course, the Channel Islands were on the wrong side of what was expected to be that, that boundary or what would naturally be that boundary. After an awful lot of um, toing and froing uh, in front of various arbitral, arbitral tribunals, in 1978, the, this award was made. And you can see that there are various French claims here in green, there are UK claims in black, there's even more outrageous UK claims in dashed lines here. The award, in fact, is, a, is the red line. And the red line is the simplest, if you like, uh, line that was created between the two coastal states. But the islands and Channel Islands were provided with an area, if you like, a buffer zone around them so that they would, uh, they would enjoy as much of their potential territorial sea themselves, even though they're sitting very close to the territorial waters of, of France. So this construction of going around these uh, un rather un inconveniently placed um, islands is, is known as enclaving. So let us look to an even more interesting area. So this is the Gulf of Guinea. The Gulf of Guinea is probably one of the world's worst, worst maritime boundary traffic jams waiting to happen. Offshore West Africa, so where we have a series of neighbors in again, one of these curved areas of coastal, rather like the Bay of Bengal, but here we have this con concave surface. The geography, which we can't refashion of course, but the geography is producing a number of claims from a number of states into exactly the same area. These are all the mainland states that are effectively vying for the same area. It, it gets worse than this because in the middle of here, we have a series of islands, which are actually sitting on top of volcanoes, but it doesn't matter. They're still land masses. And there are two islands, which are the sovereignty of Equatorial Guinea. And there are two islands in the middle of all of this, in this middle of this melee, which uh, which are the, the uh, sovereign territories of Sao Tome and Prince, uh, Principe. These are Portuguese, uh, expert Portuguese colonies. So we have, I don't know how many states here, all going for the same bit of real estate. And this is really, I, I mean, this is the real hard end of maritime unraveling. And this is the sort of uh, area that would keep um, courts and, uh, and lawyers in business um, for decades, if not centuries. So let's, we, we've, we've, we've talked about some problems with geographies, basically geography, the shape of the coast dictates. Let's have a look at some problems in interpreting or implementing the law of the sea. And these to do with coastal states or signatories, ratifying states, their perception or their interpretation of the convention and its rules. Now, so my second part is called when is an island not an island? So it's not a riddle out of Alice 
through the looking glass. It's a question that actually is played out time and time again in claims and counterclaims in disputes in the courts. Because it's very clear from the development of the convention up to its drafting and signature, as I said, that this talk about continental shelf and, and continental margin and so on, they all apply to islands. So what does UNCLOS say about islands? What does the law of the sea convention that we all signed up to say about islands? Well, it's sort of helpful, but actually tells us what an island isn't. It says rocks which cannot sustain human habitation or economic life of their own shall have no exclusive economic zone or continental shelf. So it's basically said that there are two criteria there. Can it sustain human habitation or can it have a economic life and have one or the other? But if you can't prove either of those, then it has no exclusive economic zone. It'll have a territorial sea. It can have 12 nautical miles, but it won't have the, the bigger boys beyond that. Because there are practical difficulties in, in establishing whether a rock is a rock or a, whether it sustains human habitation. Um, it's nothing about size. It's nothing about size. What if it's too small or too arid or too cold to, to sustain life? And what is life? What is economic life of its own? Could it be just a pile of bird guano, for instance, that might have some economic life? But it's of huge importance. And a, a rock that isn't an island will get its 12 nautical miles. That gives you a 12 nautical mile space. That's about 400, all the mass of the pi r squared, if you like. That gives you about 400 square kilometers. If you can prove that guy is a, an island and not a rock, that goes out to 200 nautical miles, and we're talking about 250,000 square kilometers. So islands, point sources of, of sovereignty or entitlement are the best for getting large spaces. It's the most efficient. So th there are lots of arguments by many, many coastal states, particularly, actually, particularly the old colonial states that got lo have lots of these islands scattered around the place that are convinced that they have islands rather than rocks. So let's have a look at um, some examples. Now, I, I don't, I'm, I'm sure all of you around the, the world are shouting the answer to this question, even if you haven't looked at the, uh, the credit down in the bottom right-hand corner. This, of course, is Rockall Island. And it's about 200 nautical miles away from the nearest bit of inhabited the UK, that's North Uist. And it was first it was discovered and recorded back in the 15th, 16th, and 17th centuries. It was first landed upon, as far as we know, by a chap called Basil Hall in 1811. That's not him uh, on the top there. I'll come to him in a minute. Basil was a British naval officer and um, he actually uh, was an adventurer. He sounds like a really right old chap. He published a lot of books on, you know, yeah, alligator hunting and and uh, picnicking in in mountains and things, but he did land on this uh, on this on this rock. It's about 17, 18 meters high and a bit, a bit, a bit wider across the bottom. But there's only one place to stand up on it, although there's there's somebody standing right at the top there, as you can see. There's a yellow blob there. If I can just highlight that with the cursor, that is a ledge, and that is now the only named feature on Rock Hall, apart from the island itself, is called Hall's Ledge. And that's where Basil climbed to in 1811. Now, of course, it's an important thing because in, in, in 1955, Rock Hall was annexed by the British Crown. There was a, an expedition that was sent there by the government to, uh, if you like, make the last part of British annexing territorial expansion, because no one had, people had claimed it, the Irish had claimed it, um, Iceland had claimed it, anyway, lots of people had claimed it, but no one had done it officially. In 1955, the UK did it. And actually, it wasn't until 2017, I understand, that when papers were classified regarding this 
um, this 1955 uh, decision to annex it because there were worries in case it could be used by hostile agents to spy on the, the South Uist missile testing site. That's apparently the story. So there was a move that was made by the UK to annex it. I do have another shot of Rockall. This is rather magnificent. This looks like two Moral Marines in full dress uniform by a sentry box. Now, <laughs> I'm pretty sure nobody had full dress uniform. And, and, and the, the, the videos I watched of the, the landing of the helicopters on Rockall, um, there were no pith helmets, there was no shiny brass. I think there's a lot of CGI being, or Adobe Photoshop being done on this image, but it certainly was been knocking around for some time. In 1972, Rockwell Island was officially incorporated by the UK, by the UK as part of Scotland. That's when, of course, we were all one happy union. And soon after that, well, not soon after that, but 1997, um, the UK unilaterally, I guess this is UK London, uh, unilaterally classified Rockall as a rock rather than an island. And, and it, therefore it now only is allowed its 12 nautical miles. It was pretty clear that it wouldn't sustain human life and it certainly didn't have an economic life of its own. But the starting point for the UK's 200 nautical mile limit, which is this line here, is now St Kilda. And interestingly enough, here we've also added on this map a big pink area, which is the area that the UK claims beyond 200 nautical miles. So this is the extra bit over the part of the Rockwell Plateau. And we've made an arrangement with Ireland, which is this big green area, but we only claim up to this red area. But I have to say, it's, it's very interesting that this is completely derived from base points on Kilda, St Kilda. I'm sure uh, this, hasn't, um, this hasn't escaped the attention of the First Minister of Scotland on this in terms of their devolution policy. Anyway, let's move now some 11, 12,000 kilometers across the globe to the Western Pacific. I'm, the Western Pacific here. This is a rather lurid map of the seafloor, but we're going to head into a place that's called the Persevela Basin. It's south of Japan and northeast of the Philippines. And it's here that Japan has been up to some mischief. So this little red dot, I don't know whether you've seen it, it's just suddenly appeared, but this little red dot is the site of somewhere where Japan has spent 600 million dollars and rising in the protection of one of its so-called islands, which is really in reality a small jumble of rocks, but it claims it as an island. This is Okino Torashima. It's small and not very beautifully formed. Of course it's an atoll, it's, it sits on a volcano, but it is, sits in the middle of a, an ocean basin Again, lots of mineral and fisheries resources. Uh, it certainly lies in an area of potential military significance. But at high tide, this sort of might look like an island from this distance. That might look like an island from this distance. And there's something else that might look like an island from this distance. Actually, as we'll see in a minute, they're not islands. There is an island underneath that. 60 meter uh, disc of concrete and titanium. But the island itself is about one and a half square meters. It's roughly the size of a twin bed. And it only pokes up about seven centimeters above the mean sea level. That's the big one. The others are smaller than that. So the, the, there are various reports of historical mentioned the pilots from this area who've described uh, these islands as piles of rock. They have, some people have mentioned them as five above water rocks. Uh, others were jumbles of uh, barren, con barren coral surfaces. But the 
Japanese recognizing that the territorial advantage of having a, an, an island in the middle of nowhere is enormous. And so what they've done is they've, as I said, covered it with goodness knows how many square meters of concrete and then built a detaining cage over the top. Then they built a seawall around the outside of it in order to stop uh, any overwash or any in incursion of water into the ocean. I don't think we could any, in, in, in terms of UNCLOS, I don't think this is possible to uh, support any human habitation. And it's certainly not gonna support any economic life. But the Japanese are arguing currently till they're blue in the face that this is an island. And the significance of their spending $600 million and rising is that if it claims it's 200 nautical miles successfully, it'll get its 250,000 square kilometers of land. But this site is also the basis for Japan claiming an even greater extended continental shelf beyond the 200 nautical miles. And that's another 100 and 110 odd thousand square kilometers. So it's excruciatingly important to them as to whether this was, uh, whether it's worth spending a billion dollars or so on protection. Let's have a look at something else in our list of items. So now you see it, now you don't. We mentioned this was about um, climate change, potentially climate change. And we, I didn't put any uh, graphs in here because we, we know that this is a, a apparently inexorable rise of the sea level. It's certainly risen in a number of inches, uh, 20, 20 odd centimeters um, in, in, the, in the last hundred or so years. And, the, and the, the global sea level is now got a, a, a new record high. And this, of course, matters to all of us. It matters to coastal communities, but it matters to some much more than others. So this striking, but at the same time disturbing image shows the foreign minister of Tuvalu addressing remotely and providing his address by video link to the 2021 United Nations Climate Change Conference referred to normally as COP26 held in, the, in, the, in Glasgow. And he made this address, he, it was not a stunt. I mean, not a, so much of a stunt as, a, as an attempt to draw attention to the, the plight of scores of the island communities facing inundation by rising sea levels. Tuvalu is an island that has 10,000, 11,000 population, but its highest point is only, its highest point is only just over four meters above sea level. It's not gonna be long before the, the coastal defenses uh, around or the coastal uh, reef is breached enough so that there is zero uh, fresh water on the island. But apart from that, there is a real serious significance in that this island will eventually at some stage potentially disappear. So Tuvalu, eh, along with many of its similarly endangered islands, fellow island nations, is looking at legal ways to keep its ownership of its maritime zones because not only is the land disappearing, but the attendant or the appurtenant, the, the uh, 12 nautical miles and the 200 nautical miles is, is going to shrink as the base points change, as the base points become increasingly underwater, the shape of the claimed area potentially could, could change. And various options have been, and this has been recognized and people have, have understood this, and, and various options have been put forward as to how to address this, but there is nothing in the convention to allow for this. And, and actually that's why the convention is, is creaking. It's 40 years old. It was, it was for a different world than we live in at the moment. And it, different resources have come to light since the, the plans were put in for managing those resources um, uh, that are laid down in the provisions of the, the law of the sea. 
So I think the Tuvalu and its and its fellow island nations has a real a real issue, and of course, there's an enormous amount of sympathy around the world for these states. But at the moment, nothing has been resolved for it. Now, the changing of baselines and the changing of of of, uh, of the positions of baselines is nothing new. I mean, in fact, that is something that has been recognised um, all around the world, particularly in in areas where there's uh, where they're on, on deltas or lot, lots of changes of sediment um, supply that uh, gets emptied into the into the uh, into the ocean at the mouths of those rivers or often on deltas the the changes of, of sediment are, are extreme and this is a zoom in on the end of the land boundary between India on the left of the yellow line and Bangladesh on the right of the yellow line. And it stops because this was the situation just before 2012 when Bangladesh and India needed to sort out their, their maritime boundary, as we mentioned earlier on. But this is the image, the most recent image, this is 2020 image of Google Earth. If we I'm going to just advance it by one slide, and then I'm going to go back again. This is the second image, is the Google Archive image of 1984. So we're talking of you know 40 or maybe 40 years, and oh sorry, and you can see that there is there is not an inconsiderable difference. The point that that arises out of this is that as we move our maritime boundary further out to sea, which of those base points or where those point base points are at one year is gonna be a different place from where they are in the following year. This is uh, been, as I say, it's been long recognized. This is what is known as an ambulatory or a mobile baseline. But if you have a mobile baseline for Tuvalu, it's gonna, mo it's gonna be mobile and eventually disappear. So the idea for uh, the idea for Tuvalu and its kindred spirits throughout the whole of the um, the, uh, the the Southwest Pacific is to put forward a an initiative, and this is a Google shot of the Southwestern Pacific. I think you can probably orientate yourself okay if you recognise you've got. Australia down in the bottom left, and there's New Zealand. So this whole area is, uh, is an enormous amount of claimed territory, a significant part of which will be unclaimed or disappear if the, if the, uh, if the, uh, the, 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 the sea level rise increases to the point that lands have to be abandoned. And there are already arrangements that are being planned between some of these islands and their original former colonies or their, their, their territorial dependencies. That's discussions with New Zealand and, and Australia. This is about re repatriating or rehousing um, uh, residents. But the initiative that is being developed by a wide number of coastal states in this region is one that allows them to retain the maritime areas that they rightfully have today. Why should they, in fact, disappear in the in the future if the worst things happen and the, the islands uh, are um, inundated? But yeah, I'm rather I'm a bit conscious of time. We've we've run an we, hour. If you near the end, we're just wrapping up. Good, wonderful. Thank you. So the last part of the talk and the last couple of slides is, uh, is, is, is entitled Squabble, Squabble, Spats and Making Up. And, and we're really just going to turn to the messy business of, of trying to sort out boundaries when the negotiations between, between neighbouring states have failed, either because they've broken down or they, 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 they're such catastrophically difficult geographical compl complications. Then normally the vast majority of boundaries are settled by negotiation agreement, but some resort to the court to deliver a judgment. 
And the, the cases are liable to end up somewhere like this. This is the Peace Palace in The Hague. And the processing of these cases takes years of work, years of planning, multiple pleadings, written and oral, and it can take enormous amounts of research. This means a lot of lawyers, a lot of advisors, and most recently, apparently, field excursions to provide context. On a recent example of this field excursion, this is the return of the Chagossian community to the Chagos Islands. Some people might know it as Diego Garcia, but the Chagos Islands, the magician with the uh, Mauritian territories recently awarded sovereignty by the court back from the UK. And I'd just like to point out that this gentleman is the lead counsel for Mauritius, Professor Philippe Sands, QC, who clearly understood the need to see for himself the beautiful coral fans, which have been finally wrestled back from the UK. Nice work if you can get it. So the benefit of the court is that actually a decision is finally made. It's however complex the boundaries, the decision will be made. It's been very, very clear to me that lawyers can be perfectly good at understanding uh, the point of uh, very detailed technical abilities too. But perhaps not all, because I do recall exchanging niceties with one of the judges after the pleadings had finished in a case in which I'd been given the opportunity to present a PowerPoint of relevant geology images and included an animation of plate tectonics with various oceans developing and land masses drifting. And when I met him and I asked him if he felt that this had in any way helped him understand the scientific context of the dispute, he fixed me firmly in the eye and he said, well, we don't do Disney here. And that was his way of telling me that he really couldn't cope with the technical details uh, that we were providing him with. So I think I'll stop now. We'll miss uh, some parts of it, but I'll wrap up for the evening. Apologies for, sincere apologies for running so badly over time. Um, I hope it hasn't, can I dare say, muddied the waters for you? But um, I, I consider it a, a privilege to have been able to make a presentation today. And if there's any comments or uh, any questions that I might be able to help um, from this evening, I'd be pleased to deal with those. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you.